color. In this graph, if you look at the very bottom line, that's starlight, you can see that there's not a lot of variation in that line. And uh, this is over the, the wavelength of um, color that we can see. There's a few spikes that um, have to do with the air glow that I just mentioned. But spectrally, it's very flat. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now, because these natural conditions have existed for literally millions of years, a number of species have adapted um, to this normal condition of day and night, light and dark. And specifically, nocturnal species have adapted to these extremely low levels of light. So in a, um, a review study in 2010, Franz Holker um, et al. reviewed um, all the different known species and came to the conclusion that about 63% of all species are nocturnal. Therefore, they use night as their primary um, niche and they have adapted physiologically and behaviorally to these extremely low light levels. So within the vertebrate species, we can see that 93% of all amphibians are nocturnal. And within, ma within mammals, excuse me, 100% uh, of bats, of course, are nocturnal. And then when we go on the invertebrate side, a great proportion are um, nocturnal, 64%. And then within those, lepidopterans, which are moths and butterflies, and coleopterans, which are beetles, a high percentage of those are nocturnal. So you can see that there's a, a significant portion of all known wildlife species that use nighttime uh, primarily and have adapted specifically to these very low levels of light. Now I want to point out that it's not just nocturnal species that use dark. Every species, almost every species on Earth, uses dark as well, including us, even though we're diurnal species. We need nighttime to um, rejuvenate, to recharge, uh, and to rest, as do many other diurnal species. In a study that we conducted at Colorado State University, we did a review of uh, literature which published light levels and wildlife or animal performance. And we found a significant number of studies that indicated that wildlife species use extremely low levels of light. On the bottom axis, you can see the different moon phases. We kind of adjusted the light levels to moon phase. And in the new moon phase, at or below new moon phase, those very dark levels, we found a significant number of species uh, that use that extremely low level. The crescent and quarter moon levels as well, which are also significantly dimmer than full moon, uh, we found a number of species uh, perform and utilize those low levels. On the right hand side, you see the biological effect. And these are all the different effects where animals use those low levels of light, from vocalizations to predation, community development, mating production, vigilance, all those um, are performed and require very low levels of light. And on the right, we just have some examples, a phantom midge, a tree frog, of course, the firefly and snakes all use or need very low levels of light. In fact, some species don't even come out of their um, homes if it's brighter than some of those very low levels. So we can see that these natural sources of light are important. In addition, a number of wildlife species don't see the world like we do. Um, we have very specific color vision and other mammals share our color vision. Uh, we have three primary sources of color within our cells and our eyes. But other wildlife species, such as insects like bees and also um, other mammals and um, other avian species like birds, have more cells that can see different colors. So other animals see the world very differently in not only intensity, but also in color. Now we introduce artificial sources of light. So we just talked about all the different variation within natural sources. And here we introduce anthropogenic light, which is a, a relatively new pollutant um, in the geological scale of things, um, and it is global. One thing to note about anthropogenic light and why it's so significant is that it changes everything about the natural cycle and dynamics of light and dark. On a time scale, on a spatial scale, the geographic extent, the color that is emitted, when and where it's emitted, and also the intensity that all these lights are emitted are all different than these natural cycles that all these species have evolved for for millions of years. So here's a satellite image from um, Southern California, Southern Nevada, and Western Arizona. Um, this is light detected from a passing satellite, which detects upward radiance. So that's the light going directly straight up. And you can see it's pretty significant. Obviously, you can see Los Angeles, Las Vegas, um, and Phoenix area. But light does not just go directly up in the sky when it's emitted upwards. It also scatters in the atmosphere. And we'll see what that looks like. So here's the same area with what we call sky glow. And sky glow is that scattering of light that's emitted up in the atmosphere. And I'll go back one more time just to see the upward radiance and the sky glow. So the spatial extent of light is extended when it is refracted through the atmosphere and then reflects back down on Earth. 
So why is this important? Why is natural light important to wildlife? And why is anthropogenic light um, such a, uh, a nuisance in not only national parks, but across the globe? Well, I'll take you through a couple park examples from the National Park Service. Um, in Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee and Congaree National Park in South Carolina, every year they have a spectacular two-week festival um, called the Firefly Festival. And there's synchronous firefly flashing, which happens only two weeks out of every year. And there's only a few locations on earth where this synchronous event happens. And we and two national parks happen to have these. And they celebrate this with um, a festival and with um, visitor activities and things like that. But really people come to see the flashing synchronous fireflies. Now these fireflies use their flashing to communicate and to find mates and to reproduce. So this time is critical for them and they need that dark level of natural light in order to see their mates and communicate. So not only is this a natural resource for the firefly um, reproduction and um, success, but it's also a, a resource for parks for um, education and to bring visitors in. At Congaree, for instance, um, this, this two-week event accounts for a high percentage of their annual visitation. Moving south um, to the Gulf Islands National Seashore in Mississippi and Florida, of course, may, many of you have heard of the impact of light pollution on sea turtles. Gulf Islands is home to five sea turtles, which are threatened and endangered species, and four of those nest in the park. Um, the loggerhead sea turtle is the most prevalent. And when the, the baby sea turtles hatch out of their nests at night, they find the lightest part of the horizon to go to, which usually in natural conditions is the crashing waves, the white of the crashing waves, or the moonlight reflecting off the water. In recent times with anthrop anthropogenic light in the built environment, the light condition has reversed and now the um, lit brightest portion of the environment that they see first is the built environment. And at Gulf Islands, that is due north where they need to be going due south to the Gulf. In the lower right hand corner, you see an image that shows um, squiggly lines where volunteers uh, tra traced nesting sea turtles from their emergence to see where they would go. And almost all of them went the exact opposite um, direction. So this is a huge impact on uh, hatchling sea turtles, which already face uh, um, pretty in insurmountable odds in getting to the Gulf and, and uh, growing to adulthood. Uh, also at Gulf Islands is the Perdido Key beach mouse, which is endemic to a very small portion of Florida, and it happens to be at Gulf Islands National Seashore in the dunes. This mouse is very sensitive to light and only comes out to forage when it's very dark. Even when the moon is up, it will stay close to home and um, not forage as much. So in the built environment and the conditions around Gulf Islands, there's almost a chronic um, at least quarter moon or crescent moon uh, if not brighter. Therefore, it has reduced its foraging uh, area and has uh, lost its, uh, its advantage, basically, and is, is declining in the area. And then moving west to Joshua Tree National Park, we see a unique relationship between the yucca moth and the yucca plant. This is a, the yucca moth is a nocturnal pollinator, and the yucca tree or the Joshua Tree blooms at night. And so the yucca moth has evolved to identify the contrast of dark and light with the flowers on the um, Joshua trees and uses that dark natural light to find those flowers and get nectar, which then pollinates the Joshua tree and on and on. So it's a successful relationship. Light pollution now threatens that relationship by reducing the contrast um, where night is not as dark as it once was and increases the um, difficulty of the yucca moth finding those yucca flowers. A few other functional effects that we see um, not only here in our national parks and here in the United States, but globally um, is uh, foraging effects, especially on bats. So in this image, you see the uh, iconic Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas and you that beam that they uh, throw up into the sky is incredibly bright. Those squiggles you see around that beam are bats and the smaller ones are moths. So these animals all have been kind of vacuumed up and um, trapped into this light beam and will remain there until the light falls off or uh, turns off. And so a number of these moths will either be eaten by bats or die of exhaustion. And all these bats have been pulled out of the natural desert environment around them and is, is now in the built environment of Luxor. In a 2009 study, uh, Emma Stone um, over in UK found that the impact of artificial light reduced the, or actually increased the time that bats stayed in their cave before they emerged at night um, because they're waiting essentially for dark to fall, darkness to fall, night to fall, but it never came because of light pollution. And so they left their caves later than they normally would. This desynchronized their, um, the timing where insects emerge and therefore they, it reduced their foraging success. Another functional effect is of movement. Uh, on these maps, we see some migratory patterns of 
passerine birds, um, spring and fall migrations on the top and middle on the left there, and then the Veer's nighttime lights is on the bottom, that satellite imagery at the bottom. Kyle Horton et al. at Colorado State University overlaid migratory movement and lights at night in the United States and basically created an exposure map for what migratory species and what migratory routes were most at risk from light at night. Um, and this is the bird fallout where birds will be attracted to light and fall out of their migratory route um, and get stuck in areas where they are not meant to be. There are a number of other functional effects and a myriad other species that are affected by light pollution. Um, there's a number of studies and that body of research is growing every day. Um, these are just some of the functional effects of wildlife. But really what you can take away from the functional effects from wildlife is that it can impact a single individual, it can impact a single species, it can impact taxa, but also populations and then whole ecological systems. So it has a cascading effect bottom up and top down. So some final thoughts before I go is that the natural sky is relatively dim from a human perspective, but is easily perceived by and is crit a critical factor in healthy ecosystems. And light pollution or anthropogenic light changes that fixed pattern of light and dark across time, space, color, and intensity. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, Jeremy. Um, so, our next presenter is Aubrey. Larson and our Aubrey um, works to improve the human experience through quality design, clear communication, and data-driven planning and decision-making in her position with the Utah Community Development Office. In addition to her work with the state, Aubrey provides support for landscape scale dark sky conservation eff efforts throughout the Four Corners region as coordinator for the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative. As a passionate designer, cartographer, researcher, night sky, night sky advocate, and regional planner, she, she believes in, that in order to plan for an uncertain future, we must first understand and respect the relationship between people, place, and policies. Um, I love that bio so much, Aubrey. Um, so I see that you, you're good to go. I'm gonna pass it to you. Awesome, can you hear me okay? I can indeed. Awesome. And I think I'm going to just turn my video off so I don't get distracted by myself. So just a second. Okay. Can you all still hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay, good. Sorry. I've had mic issues this whole, it feels like, year. Uh, hi, guys. So my name is Aubrey Larson. And like uh, Kristen said, I work for the state of Utah in the Community Development Office. I'm based out of Salt Lake City, and I have been the coordinator for the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative for about two years now, which has been an incredible opportunity um, to integrate that with the work I do for the state and supporting rural communities. And the whole reason I got involved is because many of those communities had started asking questions about how could they protect their night skies. and we were able to develop some tools and resources to help those communities and it's led to me being the coordinator, which I am really excited to talk about the Dark Sky Cooperative with you today. My objectives today are to highlight the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative as an example of regional dark sky conservation and then also discuss the big picture, landscape ecology, how light pollution affects these natural systems, having a holistic mindset, and then leave you with some resources to help you with your own goals. So diving in, I wanted to start with the cooperative's mission. If this um, is new to you, the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative was formalized in about 2012, and the mission hasn't really changed since then. I, I'll read that really quickly. So the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative is a voluntary initiative to link communities, tribes, businesses, state agencies, federal agencies, and citizens in a collaborative effort to celebrate the view of the cosmos, minimize the impact of outdoor lighting, protect natural nighttime skies, and restore natural darkness in areas where it has been degraded. And then just this last year, we added a fourth element to that mission statement promote astronomy-based recreation and tourism. 
Um, the cooperative is not owned by a single entity. It's not a nonprofit. It's an initiative and it's supported by all of these different entities working together, which is kind of a, a really cool system. This is a timeline of the cooperative's history starting in 1999 with the formation of the National Park Service Night Sky Team. And I'll just highlight a couple of different elements of this timeline. So in 2001, Flagstaff, Arizona became the first international dark sky city. And I believe someone else is going to talk a little bit more about the IDA's program and why a community or other land area would be interested in participating. But essentially Flagstaff took some very proactive steps to understand their community's lighting and then proactively mitigate light pollution to protect their night skies, which was huge. Uh, just jumping to 2006, this is when the concept of a dark sky park was born, um, evolving from these other conversations about dark sky preserves, landscape scale conservation of the night sky. And then in 2000, 2007, Natural Bridges National Monument in Southeast Utah became the first international dark sky park. And this was also the same year that the first map showing a proposed boundary for the cooperative was shown. In 2011, the National Park Service initiative, A Call to Action Starry Starry Night, established America's first dark sky cooperative. And as I mentioned, 2012 was the birth year of the cooperative itself. And the structure of the cooperative has changed over time. There have been three coordinators. I'm the third coordinator. And what's really cool with it being so loosely structured is each different coordinator can bring their different perspectives, skill sets, connections, and really help define the work being done, which is really cool. Here is another light pollution map for you showing the geographic location of the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative. Hopefully you can see kind of that thicker white line. It encompasses a large portion of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. And I'm sure you're familiar with the Colorado Plateau as an eco region, but the boundary for the cooperative is more informed by light pollution as opposed to geography, which is interesting. And just this last year, a second dark sky cooperative was established just to the west of us. It's the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative. And the hope is that someday there will be other regional cooperatives supporting dark sky advocacy efforts throughout the rest of the United States and the world. So I wanted to highlight some of the unique physical and cultural geography of this region. And I love maps. When I went to school, I studied bioregional planning and landscape architecture and just really learned to love maps and the ability to analyze data and make it attractive and easy to understand. So looking at the Plateau region, there's some unique factors that contribute to the area's pristine night skies. So first, there's high elevations. The plateau's highest mountain peak is at 12,600 feet above sea level, and then at the lowest point, it's about 750 feet above sea level. And we know that higher altitudes improve stargazing because the turbulence present in lower atmospheres is reduced. This region also has very low precipitation with only about an average of eight inches of rain per year. And we know that less cloudy days mean clearer skies and better visibility of the dark sky. This region is also dominated by multiple dark sky or uh, national parks, state parks, public lands. About 60% of the plateau's land area is designated as public open space. And people come from all over the world to experience uh, what this region has to offer. And then last of all, there's sparse populations. We know where people are, that's generally where we'll find light pollution. And the plateau has relatively low population sizes. So those are some of those characteristics of the region. So switching gears just a little bit, uh, when I became the coordinator, this was the first question I asked, what does a dark sky cooperative do? And there's never been a set answer to that. I mean, we have our mission statement. It's pretty clear what we're trying to accomplish, but how do we do that and what's the framework for that? And so we established these five cooperative objectives to help classify and define the work that we do. So first, establishing and supporting the dark sky network, so making sure that all the different 
communities, parks, dark sky advocates, businesses, residents are supported, that they find mutual benefit, can share best practices, and work together. Uh, outreach and education is huge for dark sky advocacy, helping people understand the concept of dark skies and that it doesn't mean dark community, it just means uh, using best practices to mitigate light pollution and protect the night sky. Uh, education is a large portion of the work that we do. We also develop tools, guides, and resources to help folks assess the lighting in their community to better understand light pollution, lighting ordinances, those kinds of things. And so we help to create and develop different resources that way. We provide some training and technical assistance, as you probably gathered from Jeremy's presentation. Some of this can get very technical, lots of data, um, sky quality measurements, those kinds of things. So helping connect people with experts in the field, whether that's a lighting engineer or a public policy professional, we try and help make those connections to answer questions. And then the fifth item is communication design, and this is huge for me. I studied landscape architecture and a big part of our program was learning how to communicate with design and using um, quality design to communicate principles and ideas that might be difficult to understand, using infographics to help people interpret data, uh, branding, using imagery. We all love beautiful night sky photography. All of these things combined can help communicate our message and our objectives and goals. So landscape ecology is probably an important thing to consider when we're looking at a regional context. And landscape ecology is essentially the study of relationships between ecological processes and the environment. And so just looking at some of the different players here, we have wildlife. Jeremy already talked about how artificial light at night can have huge impact on birds. The image to the left is meant to be a shocker. Those are all birds that had collided with buildings. Uh, but also light pollution has an impact on plants. In fact, this image that you see in the middle, I believe those are soybean crops and farmers have seen the effects of these crops being planted adjacent to high pressure sodium roadway lighting. It has a physiological change on these plants and you see they're kind of a different color, which is really interesting. And then of course, people are part of that ecology, whether we want to be or not, we're part of these complex systems. We've introduced artificial light into the environment and it has an impact on wildlife and plants. And for people, there's lots of different health benefits for not having ourselves exposed to artificial light at night. All day, every day we have screens constantly on. Um, we, we also depend on those natural circadian rhythms a signal to our bodies when it's time to sleep, to rest. Uh, they found that light pollution can also contribute to different diseases, breast cancer, depression, obesity, mood disorders, those kinds of things. And if that argument doesn't appeal to you, there's also the economic argument that we're wasting energy and it's estimated that about $3 billion of energy is wasted every year on lighting that doesn't even touch the ground. And I believe there will be someone else to share some of those stats with you. So recognizing that we're connected in these complex systems. There are three critical ingredients for landscape scale night sky conservation to be successful. Uh, people, places, and policies. And I think this is the, my favorite part of being the coordinator. I get to meet incredible people who are advocates for dark sky conservation. So if we can understand the people who, who live there, what are their goals, what are their concerns, what, how can we communicate the importance of dark sky conservation to them, what appeals to them, understanding places, what makes people feel comfortable in this place, what's their sense of place, what locations are being visited, are there parks, are there other places that people come to visit, how can we understand our geography, uh, then making sure that the policies that are created speak to both the people and places that they influence and that they're sustainable, easily enforced and interpreted. And then code enforcement is a big part of that being successful as well. If you want to learn a little bit more about the cooperative, you can visit our website at cpdarkskies.org. We just 
updated our toolbox with several different tailored toolkits depending on your needs. I won't go into those, but we are always looking to improve our toolbox. So if you go and you're like, oh, this should be in there too, just let me know. I'd, I'd love to include other resources. And then I just wanted to end my segment with this awesome quote from Kate Cannon, the Southeast Utah Group Superintendent. And this is talking about Arches National Park, which was recently certified um, July 5th of 2019. And it was the culmination of more than 10 years effort. And she said, the work that was done at Arches National Park was a team effort, including National Park Service employees, the Friends of Arches and Canyonlands National Parks, and the City of Moab and Grand, Grand County. It was a true team effort. And I think that really summarizes regional dark sky conservation. It's a team effort, and as long as we consider the people, places, and policies within our goals, I, I think we can be successful in protecting our starry sky heritage. And with that, that's my contact info. If you want to reach out, darkskycooperative at gmail.com. Thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Aubrey, for sharing. Um, our next presenter is uh, Scott McFarland, and he is the Chief of Resource Management um, at Bandelier National Monument. As Chief of Resources, he is responsible for compliance as well as stewardship of all natural cultural resources within, I should say natural and cultural resources within Bandelier. Scott holds a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science with a minor in Biology and has worked for the National Park Service since 2011. Scott, I'm going to hand it off to you. Oh, you're muted. I'm money muting. There we yeah. go. I got it. <laughs> Might have been fighting you there. All right. Yes. So I'm Scott McFarland, Chief of Resource Management at Bandelier National, and I used to be a Regional Resource Specialist with the National Division uh, prior to coming to Bandelier. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the National Silence Night Skies Division and kind of National Park Service as a whole efforts um, around night sky protection. And then some of the data um, in the local area for Bandelier and the Vias Caldera. Um, and then just a couple of examples of bad lighting and good lighting and um, how we can improve. So National Park Service likes to say that half the park is after dark. Um, so it's been touched on pretty heavily. Um, but one thing I want to draw everybody's to is in the lower right hand corner there's a person with a lab and a funky looking piece of equipment and that is a camera that was developed by the night skies team um, to collect data on light pollution in national parks and using that camera uh, takes a series of those 45 total um, to create a mosaic image of the entire night sky um, from a 360 degree view. Um, so if you just spun around in circles um, and looked at the horizon and straight up, um, that's basically what this camera would compile. And using that data um, in areas that are extremely pristine, where they, there's an absence of any light pollution, uh, they're able to measure the percentage of um, natural light in the environment and, and the sources of those lights. So as you can see, there's, there's air glow, galactic, zodiacal, and stars. So all of those are natural sources of light in the night sky. So if you go out to a pristine um, environment and you take a look around, you'll see all of these different things out there. Unfortunately, there's uh, that's not a very common experience. In most places you go, you'll experience some sort of light pollution. So if you take those 45 image, image and compile them all together, and then um, you'll end up with what's on top. Um, so the image on top is from Acadia National Park, and that shows uh, all the light pollution as well as all the natural light um, in those photos. And if you subtract out the natural component, you're left with just the light pollution component or the anthropogenic, and that is the bottom image. 
So this is Acadia. Um, just wanted to throw this up there um, so folks could see um, a pretty good night sky um, in the eastern US. Here's an example from Fort Union, New Mexico. Um, it's pretty good skies. So if you're looking for um, a fairly close spot to go check out a relatively pristine sky, uh, this would be a great location. Not all that far from, from where we're at. Um, a really pristine night sky that exists in a national park unit is out at Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. So you can see on the bottom there, there's very, very little light pollution. And part of that is because there's some decent terrain shielding. You can see the shadows of some mountains right there, but um, also very distant from any major population centers. What we don't want to see is an example from Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Uh, this is the most heavily visited national park. Um, I was formerly uh, duty stationed out of this site. And as you can see, the night sky is almost completely blocked out um, by anthropogenic sources. Um, there's a lot of people that live in that area, um, not directly in the Smokies, but just surrounding it. And although there's not a lot of light pollution coming from the park, um, the area within the park is still impacted um, by all these outside cities. So you can just barely make out the Milky Way on a really good, clean, clear night. Um, and over time, it's likely if, if no action is taken that uh, eventually you'll no longer be able to see the Milky Way from this location. So this is where we don't, don't want to go in the Southwest. Out of the Valles Caldera, um, pretty good night sky as well. Um, still a lot of great opportunities to go out there and enjoy the Milky Way and uh, see a, a relatively good night sky that's very, very close to um, Los Alamos. And from Bandelier, um, not quite as good as the Valles Caldera. And part of that is this location is up by the fire, if you're familiar with the park. And you get a little bit um, less terrain shielding than you do at the Valle Grande. So you know, you're sitting in that volcanic cone and that prevents a little bit of light pollution. Uh, you're also a little closer um, to some of the sources at Bandelier at this particular location. So our main three sources of light pollution, of course, are Santa Fe, um, Los Alamos and White Rock itself, as along with the laboratory, and then Albuquerque are all impacting the night sky here locally. But it's still a great location to go out and be able to enjoy the night sky. So I went out in my backyard the other day and was able to enjoy um, some meteor showers. Uh, these measurements have been taken in park units throughout the country. Um, this is a little bit outdated, so there's been a little bit added here and there. Uh, but as you can see, it's a pretty comprehensive. Uh, network of measurements. Uh, there's a necessity to have really great conditions um, to collect this data. So there can't be any clouds in the sky, it can't be raining, anything like that. Um, so as you can imagine, um, in portions of the US, it's very hard to find uh, a window during which this data can be collected. So the Night Skies team is always ready to go to several locations throughout the country at the drop of a hat and get one of the, you know, maybe a couple of days that exist uh, where you can collect this data. So as you can see, it's a little easier in the Southwest. Um, we have a, a little bit uh, easier time with precipitation and uh, there's also a little less light pollution. So a lot of the initial measurements were to establish some of this data. Um, in Bandelier specifically, uh, we've been working to address our own light pollution and set an example um, of what good lighting could look like. Um, so we've been completing a, a lighting inventory over the last couple of years. And even in a, a small park like Bandelier, uh, there's still quite a few, or a, quite a bit of infrastructure. And all of that infrastructure has lights on. And uh, between the two main developed areas, uh, which is in the historic district and in our Mesa Top housing area, uh, we have about 100 light fixtures. And most of them in the historic district are, are pretty compliant, but in our own housing area, um, a number of them are not compliant. So we've been working to improve uh, that condition. The example of uh, you know, a good light and a bad light that you'll see out there pretty commonly, especially in Los Alamos, is the jelly jar there on the left, and a simple um, downward projecting canister light um, on the right. And below both of those is a um, 
image showing um, how much the light scatters when it's not shielded. So what this results in is about seven and a half times um, the amount of light trespass comes from the jelly jar versus the canister of light. And you actually end up with more light on the ground using the canister at the same bulb. It's about one and a half times the amount. So what that means is that you put the light where it needs to be to actually light your path. And because you put the light where it needs to be, you can use a reduced wattage bulb. So you can get away with reducing your energy even more. And why that's important, um, I'll get to here in a minute. Um, an example of where this has been applied on a little bit larger scale is Chisos Mountain Lodge in Big Bend. Uh, they underwent a, a lighting retrofit project a number of years ago. And this is just an image showing the, the difference um, from that retrofit. And zoomed out a little bit, you can see uh, the impact this has on the overall landscape. So just small changes like just pointing the lights down and making sure you put the light where it's needed uh, can really have a really big impact. So everyone can still navigate this area, get around, go to their lodge um, just as easily as they could before, if not easier because they don't have glare in their eyes. And we're also pr improving uh, the resource condition at the same time. So one component of wasting all this light that commonly gets missed is that it takes a lot of electricity and energy to produce all this light that is then wasted. It's just like food waste. You go to the grocery store, buy a bunch of food, it all goes bad, you throw it in the trash, it has to get transported. Well, there's a cost to light pollution and wasted light energy as well. Um, you know, during a time when we're, we're all, have, you know, kind of tight budgets and we're experiencing the effects of climate change um, in our local community with large scale forest fires and increasing temperatures and prolonged drought. Um, this is a pretty simple problem to solve to help also address that larger issue. So what is fully sustainable lighting? What can you do? Well, you can get rid of the things like those jelly jars, pick up one of those canister lights, uh, replace your light with, um, you know, if you've got a white light, replace or a blue light that use maybe like sunlight is a common thing that you'll see on light bulbs, like sunlight. Well, you don't want that. You actually wanna go with some sort of amber light. So just doing things like that, a single light fixture, it might cost you $25, $30 to replace. Um, they're hot, available on Amazon or Home Depot, all over the place, um, super easy to replace. It's usually a couple of wires. Might not even have to hire an electrician to do it. So uh, only light where you need it, when you need it, use shielding, use amber lighting, and use the minimum of light necessary for the task, and use the most efficient lamp you possibly can. So usually an LED. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. I'm thinking star a co-host. <clears throat> Before we start, a little about STAR. So um, our last presenter before our Q&A is STAR Woods. She has worked in various positions with public land management agencies in northern New Mexico since 2015 and has worked with the National Park Service in the Los Alamos area since 2018. She is currently a park guide at Valles Caldera National Preserve. Okay, sir, we're ready for you. Um, Kristen, I'm having trouble sharing my screen. Hmm. My co-host. Let me redo. There you go. Hi everyone, I'm Starwoods. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what national parks are doing and then I'm gonna kind of wrap things up and um, talk about also things that you can do and maybe some more specifics um, in addition to what Scott just said. So um, the Natural Resource Stewardship and Science Directorate develops, utilizes, and distributes natural social science tools to help parks fulfill their mission 
to protect resources. Um, they put together a synthesis of studies on the effects of artificial light. And this graphic I'm showing actually came from one of those studies that they looked through. Um, and it shows that light pollution has actually increased in the last 50 years. And most of it is from the built environment or anthropogenic light. Another study that came out of that synthesis was Owens and Lewis um, from 2018. Um, they talked about artificial light at night. Um, so kind of going back to what Jeremy was saying, um, there are definitely effects on nocturnal insects. So it can disrupt temporal patterns, meaning migration patterns and mating patterns. And I have this wonderful picture of the Miller moth, um, which if you're in Los Alamos or anywhere near here, you remember the moth apocalypse from May. They were actually migrating up to higher elevations like Vias caldera. And they're important at the caldera because bears will feed on them in the summer and it provides a good source of protein for the bears up there. Um, so if that's disrupted, then it could be bad. It could have larger ecological effects. Other effects could interfere with spatial orientation. So that's their navigation. Could um, act as a fatal attraction. So Jeremy mentioned earlier that when they're attracted to the light, they can be preyed on by bats or other predators. Um, 30 to 40% of them die either due to collision, dehydration, overheating, or um, predation. It could reduce their visual sensitivity. So it could blind them or temporarily blind them and alter foraging activity and species interactions. So they could actually lose their ability to recognize predators. So what we're doing at Bias Caldera, um, we, Bandelier is also submitting an international dark sky park application this year. And there's a lot that really goes into it. The application takes one to three years. Um, we've been working on it since 2018. And um, part of what we've done is this external lighting retrofit project, which I have a picture. This is on the right hand side, Mayor Suite um, from Hama Springs. And on the left, that is the um, owner of Hidden Valley Sporting Goods, also down in the La Cueva area. Our friends group purchased these light fixtures and I delivered it to them. And so I think by the end of this week, they should be changing their fixtures on the building on Hidden Valley and then all of the fixtures in the plaza at Hema Springs. And so we worked with them in Los Amigos to get that done. And all of that was for the Dark Sky Park application. Um, we also created a Hema's Mountains Night Sky Consortium. Um, Peak is a member, we're all just trying to work together to create darker skies and preserve the night sky. Um, Bias Caldera, we did designate a 24 hour night sky observation site. So if you go to any of the pullouts on New Mexico 4 that overlook the Valle Grande, those are designated night sky observation sites. Um, I, we got a lot of wonderful photos from back when Neo eyes when you can still see it. So that was really great. Um, and I just want everyone to know you can visit anytime. Um, we also have taken sky quality meter readings. So that's something Scott had mentioned. And I think Galen and Didier are on here. So huge thanks to those two. They volunteered to help me last week to go take those readings. Um, and we're also, we're changing our light fixtures as well and the light bulbs there. We at Bias Caldera recognize the night sky as a fundamental resource and value. Um, in addition to wildlife, we view it as a cultural and historical resource that we commit to protecting. So what is an International Dark Sky Park? Um, it's a certification from the International Dark Sky Association. Um, it's a place that has exceptional starry nights and a nocturnal environment that is specifically protected for its scientific, natural, educational, cultural heritage, or public enjoyment. Um, like Aubrey mentioned earlier, there can also be 
international dark sky communities as well as parks and other designations um, from the International Dark Sky Association. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it takes one to three years. So it's really awesome that um, Vias Caldera and Bandelier are gonna submit it this year. So hopefully Los Alamos will have two certified international dark sky parks right nearby. Um, and there are very specific conditions that need to happen before you can apply. So the Milky Way needs to be readily visible to the unaided eye. There should be no artificial light sources yielding significant glare. So, and any light domes present should be dim or restricted in extent. So that's kind of what Scott was showing in those photos earlier, um, the light domes and the light glares. So um, these are things that you can do. Light only what you need, use energy efficient bulbs, direct lights down, only use it when you need it, choose warm white light bulbs. So bulbs and outdoor fixtures should be, if they are greater than 500 initial lamp lumens, should be shielded. So like number three here, pointed down. Um, and the light, as you can see in this photo, should be about the same as the shield. Um, it shouldn't, the light bulb shouldn't be below that. Um, and the color temperature, like Scott mentioned, it really should be amber light. There's less of the blue light that's really harmful in those amber lights. And if you're looking at um, like a box, if you're buying light bulbs, it shouldn't exceed 3000 kelvins. So what we recommend are LED bulbs with a low wattage and an amber glow. And the light lumens, for an example, a standard 100 watt bulb would have 1600 lumens. So this is an example of some residential lighting before any measures were done. And this is the same one after they've pointed it down. So you can see um, the real difference there, kind of close up and what it would look like on a house. The benefits, um, there have been studies about safety. It actually reduces glare for drivers and pedestrians so if you think this always happens to me, I get blinded by the light at night from headlights when I'm driving and things. Um, and actually too much light can make it harder to see. It makes this less safe by creating shadows and it could actually give criminals a place to hide. And there have been studies in the UK that said the reduction of light did not actually increase any crime. Health. These are, this is something Aubrey mentioned earlier, the blue light in lights can contribute to various health conditions and you actually can get better rest with amber light because it more feels like candles or sunset that your body really needs um, for better rest at night. And then again, the environment, it does reduce waste and energy consumption and the lower watt light bulbs saves you um, more energy and more money. And that's all. If you guys have any questions, I think any of us would be happy to answer them. And there's my info at the bottom. Awesome. So I'm just going to get uh, everyone that presented to turn on your video if you feel comfortable. Um, so everyone can see your smiling faces. <laughs> and uh, we do have a couple questions. Um, this first one is more like a comment, but I think it's interesting and would like maybe your collective opinions. Um, it's from Heidi and Heidi says, firstly, fantastic job, everyone. So yay. Uh, and she inquires, I wonder if there is some value for the International Dark Sky Association to have another category besides pristine. It seems like there would be a lot of value as far as education, building, advocacy, and awareness. 
um, going in, having a critical protection cat or critically critical to protect credit category. Any opinions? I can talk a little bit about this. Um, so the IDA um, did formerly have a, a set of tiers. So they had like a, a gold, bronze, and silver tier. Um, and you, you got your international dark sky designation based on that tier. Um, that model is slowly moving away, um, but it doesn't mean that you can't qualify as an international dark sky place. Um, as an example, um, my old position out at Great Smoky, uh, we did a lot of work out at Mammoth Cave, um, which has a lot of light pollution, um, but is also close to a lot of urban centers and is really important to connecting with more of the populace. So we, you know, inventoried all the lights out there. Um, they started up their own dark sky program. Uh, the local community started their own IDA chapter. And a lot of people started to coalesce around this idea of dark sky protection in an area where it had never really been talked about and is close to a lot of people. So it's something that are, um, that's, that's just part of their program now. Um, it's just not as formalized. Okay. And I could add, yeah, the the, um, the urban night sky places is a new, yeah, a new um, category. So there's a number of that same question has been asked uh, nationwide, and I think worldwide, uh, folks who were very interested and passionate about night skies and about the impacts of light pollution, yet they were living in the midst of urban places. So they wanted to um, these these vocal um, uh, passionate folks wanted a some sort of recognition for work that they're doing in their own communities, urban communities, to bring awareness to this issue and to educate the public about night skies. So this, yeah, urban night skies places is very new and, uh, but I think it's going to get a lot of traction and get a lot of applications because there's a lot of passionate folks out there who recognize the importance of night skies, even in urban places. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have a question particularly about the Valle, um, outside of the pull-offs um, off of Route 4, are there special permissions that individuals currently or normally need to access the preserve for nighttime photography? And it's a two-parter, so I can, I can hold off and let you answer that part first. <laughs> um, yeah, so right now you do have to get um, special permission to go there at night from our superintendent. Um, you're welcome to contact me if you are an ASHA photographer because we're always looking for new photos. I'm really trying to build um, our media and our photos of the preserve at night. Um, so maybe I could get you maybe a volunteer agreement to come on at night. So yeah, just you send me an email. Awesome. Cool. Um, and then the second part of that is, um, have you ever offered programs for night photography for firefly and or night sky photography or after, fingers crossed, corona um, sort of restrictions lift, would that be an option? Um, we haven't really had any special programs for night photography where you know as a five-year-old preserve of the national park service just within the past year is when we were really starting to build our astronomy program mm -hmm. and so i'm thinking in the future you know post-covid we can start doing things like um i think it'd be awesome to have a night where i can have an event for astrophotographers to come out or different things like that um but yeah, for right now, and we are looking, we're in the planning phases of future bias caldera, maybe 10 years down the road, mm -hmm. of maybe having the road or a different place that's not the pullouts as a the 24-hour access point. Awesome. So that it's a little bit more protected from headlights. Cool, great. So yes, there's plenty of options. Um, so at the very beginning, um, Galen asked, um, would y'all be open to sharing your slides? Absolutely. Nods, yeah, nice, cool. 
So I'll grab those from you and make sure they go out to everyone that's listening tonight. Um, and then last, okay, yeah, I had this question too. Um, are there fireflies in the caldera, caldera that are actually luminescing at night? I didn't think there were very many in the West. Um, not, not that I know. I don't think they're a thing in the West. Um, they are. They are. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They so we, we actually have a couple of species of fireflies um, mm -hmm. between the two two units, but they're very uncommon. So there's nothing quite like the synchronous fireflies. Uh, they're much more rare. But uh, when I first got here, I actually found one um, like my second week, and they hadn't been documented in like 15 years. So I know that we have them, uh, but they're very rare. <laughs> and in, and they luminous at night, really? Yeah, that's how I found it. I was I was looking for bats at night, and we found one. That's very exciting to me. One of the obviously. larval stages ones. Yeah, nice, cool. So cool, they cool. are around, but yeah, don't expect to get those cool pictures like that. <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> but maybe, yeah, you might get super lucky. Let us know if you find something like that. <laughs> um, awesome. So, um, last question is again. Thank you to all the presenters. Y'all did great. It's true. Um, any, just kidding, we got one more. Any advice for approaching the Los Alamos County government? Um, maybe this would be an Aubrey question. <laughs> um, and, how, and, and how about Santa Fe and Espanola? So how do we basically approach our local governments about dark sky initiatives? Ooh, that's a whole nother presentation. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well, I... I think the most important thing is to just start the conversation, right? And and start resolving concerns. I think a lot of people have misconceptions about dark skies, light pollution. They they think it's an environmental initiative, which part of it is, but being able to understand what's important to these people in leadership positions and making sure that you you gather other people to your cause, make sure that you you come united and What's interesting in, in Utah, we're working on a dark sky reserve initiative in the southeast part of the state. And we decided early on that we're not going to call it a dark sky reserve. We're going to refer to it as a night sky reserve. And just tweaking the language slightly helped to resolve some of the concerns in that region. So focusing on night as opposed to dark. So there's things like that that can make a difference when you're trying to talk to local leaders um, and make sure that they understand what your goals are. And there's some really cool things that other states have done. I know Colorado declared June Dark Sky Month, I believe, last year. So getting the lieutenant governor to sign that resolution was huge for them and brought that recognition. So, um, yeah, there's lots of different things you can do. Just just get started and, and start slow. I can add just a little bit here in Fort Collins, the, the city government has been retrofitting lights um, and improving their old lighting technology with new LED technology. There's many avenues to kind of approach city governments um, that are kind of win-win situations. One of those is maintenance costs and um, just the overall maintenance that happens on these uh, lighting systems. The old technology often requires bulb changes, which requires a bucket truck to run roll out, which is very expensive. So um, the new LED technology is improving rapidly and the reliability is also improving. So um, the maintenance, the cyclical maintenance costs go down. There is an initial upfront cost um, for um, going to LED lighting, but that provides not only the control of color and um, where the beam, where the light beam is thrown, but also improves costs um, for maintenance. And then of course the energy savings is enormous. So there's, you can appeal to the wallet, you can appeal to the aesthetic, you can appeal to um, the public often, especially using those lower uh, color temperatures, the more amber uh, colors, you can decrease that uh, light trespass onto people's, the facades of their houses by controlling the light, things like that. So definitely different avenues. Um, you can appeal to the city government for uh, the win-win situation for improving lighting and saving energy. Awesome, great. So I um, just want to double check in case anyone wants- Can I add wants... one more thing? Thank yes, you. please do. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, the other thing that's important to note for Los Alamos specifically is uh, there is a lighting ordinance um, in the, the county regulations. So uh, go find that. You can just look up Los Alamos lighting ordinance. It's buried somewhere. Um, so it, you know, it's worth bringing those types of things um, up at the city council meetings, those types of things. 
it's also worth um, thanking the county when they do you know good work with lighting um, and the example of that is at mountain elementary which is very close to my house uh, there were a number of like wall pack lights that were had terrible glare and uh, while they're doing all this renovation of the school they're actually replacing it with night sky friendly lighting um, so going out and looking at examples like that and, and just reaching out to the city council is, is probably one of the most effective ways here locally Okay, awesome. Thank you everyone for commenting. Um, do you have a more, I guess Galen just, <laughs> last question. Uh, Galen just asked, typed chapter 16 through 276, outdated and unenforced. Is there a more updated version that you know of? As far as I know, I, I believe that's the most up-to-date. Um, okay. I think the city is starting to re visit this conversation. Um, so the two park units, you know, it's well outside of our, our jurisdiction. Um, but, you know, just using the parks as kind of the, the example and, and the impacts to uh, those parks uh, is kind of the impetus for maybe revisiting some of that um, can be helpful and we can be part of that conversation. So, and tap into, you know, some of the expertise that exists um, in the local area as the, the council is working on. Definitely, like all of you, my question to you was going to be on each of the end, on the end of your slides, is your info on, on them? Mine is not. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> cool, so when I get that from you, I'll make sure to put that on there, or if you can. Yeah, I'll add it. Awesome, well, thank you to all of you for giving such fantastic presentations. They were extremely informative. Um, I know I learned a lot. And um, to everyone that is with us tonight, um, thank you so much for joining us. So yeah, thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a lovely evening. Thank you again to our presenters. You're all incredible. Um, yeah, have a great night.